is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering The Magicians, Season 2, Episode 9, Lesser Evils. In this episode, this episode really stressed me the fuck out, guys. I'm not even totally sure why. It just... It felt like everybody was so unhappy and everybody was so disappointed with the way that other people were behaving. And I really hate the establishing of someone manipulating another person and knowing that that is going to come out. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Thank you so much to Ashley for commissioning this episode. Guys, oh my God, this episode stressed me out so bad. I don't like, there was such a variety of things that stressed me out. And some of them were more wrapped up by the end than others. Um, Oh, okay, I'm just going to get into it. So let's talk about what's going on with Quentin first, because it turns out that he has been put into basically a dungeon. I had no idea how things were going to progress from when Penny found out that there was something about Alice inside of his head. But I didn't think this was how it was going to start, that it's just immediately him in a cage. Um. Jesse in the comments is saying, I feel like there was a ton of cutting between scenes really quickly, more than normal. Huh. I don't think I noticed that consciously, but that might have been part of why I was stressed out also. Um, But as it turns out, he's being given a checkup, but there's a fucking guy with sexually transmitted lycanthropy in the next cage over. Um, He is... Quentin is being examined and he is told that he's dying and that he will be dead in literally days if he doesn't figure out what he is going to do with Alice. And he says that he's not boxing her up and that he can't lose her again. And this, I mean, I just talked about this in the previous episode. It's so funny that this is coming up again. Um, Ashley says it's Josh. Do you know what? I thought that he was that same actor. And then I was just like, maybe the makeup just like makes him look like that. Oh my God. I didn't know it was him. I like thought it looked like him, but then I was like, no. Oh, Josh, you goober. No wonder Penny wants to shoot him with a silver bullet because he's just like over this dude. Um, yeah. Cause he just bailed. Listen, I'm not mad at you for doing that, Josh. I know Penny's bitter, but I'm not. That's so funny. Um, but yeah, so like this whole thing is basically, it's a metaphor for him having to deal with his grief about Alice is essentially what this is. Like he is holding on to her and if he doesn't let go of it, it will kill him because what he's holding on to isn't even really her. It's something else that's hurting him. And it's a pretty clever idea, honestly, forcing him to come to terms and make a choice here. And I like the way that this winds up working out. Um, But we will get to that in a second. He's just like in really bad shape and bleeding and everything is terrible. So then we go to Fillory and Margot is having another meeting with her advisors. Um, I believe that Elliot is there for this one, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah. And she has a different look than usual. She's got really heavy, smoky eye, but really light nude lipstick, which is just so jarring to me because I'm so used to her seeing those really dramatic, just seeing the really dramatic lips on her. Um, But yeah, this meeting 
is all about what's going on with the money and the fact that they are like in a better position than they were before, but they are still kind of fucked. Um, that they, <laughs> what is it that she says that, uh, we have like the, the, I think at a later point, she says, thank God they don't have polls here because they are just so unpopular. Um, and the lights are all flickering. So the brownouts that they are experiencing are just starting to speed up. And eventually they come to this idea that if they want to avoid a war, what Elliot is going to have to do is fight in single combat. And this will not only restore them to a time of peace, allegedly, in theory, but it will also make him one of the most popular leaders in Filorian history, because he will be putting his own life on the line on behalf of his country, essentially, really what it is, his kingdom. It's like a huge gesture. And it's also full of glory to overcome another king this way. Now, it is unclear to me whether or not he will be as popular now due to what he winds up choosing as an alternative to killing the other king. I don't know if this will be looked on with the same generosity of spirit as the other. Um, but anyway, he says rulers going to rumble in the goofiest moment ever. And I really didn't know what to think because we know he's not a fighter. I was just like, how is this going to work? And it didn't really occur to me that the king he was going to go up against would not have magic, which is, it appears that way that the other king doesn't have magic. Um, but that, I mean, I guess not everybody necessarily has it. It's it's much like Earth in that there are people with and without. Um, so let me go to, after the credits, fucking Katie and Penny breaking Julia out of Fillory Jail. And it's so funny because, man, this whole, like... Compared to where Quentin is being kept, when Margot said throw her in the dungeon, she really didn't mean that, evidently, because Julia's in basically a lovely little bedroom. Like, she's being extremely well taken care of, considering. And I understand the cage in Quentin's case because he has something in him that's like dangerous. But holy shit, Julia is also pretty fucking dangerous. And I wouldn't have been mad at them if they had done the same thing and made it a little bit more difficult to get her broken out because it doesn't take too much. All they have to do is pretty much like send one of the guards to sleep with a magical spell and then bust up in there and get her out and it's done. And it's a real creepy moment. Like they're talking about why she got thrown in here and she explains to Penny about killing a bunch of trees and specifies that they could talk. And Katie says they have trees that can talk. And Julia says not anymore and starts giggling. But the thing is, didn't they say that there are others? I really thought that there were more. That this, like, wasn't the end of the trees that could talk. Am I incorrect on that? But she seems very confident. And she starts laughing and Katie gives her a look like yikes what the fuck um so they bounce up out of there and what we wind up finding out is that the Reynard's son is a senator and apparently he does not know that he has any sort of power which honestly is kind of indicative of how privileged his life must be because he winds up accidentally 
throwing them all to the floor in an effort to defend himself. But when he does that, he passes out. I would assume that he would have noticed if he'd been able to do this earlier in his life. And if he hasn't done it earlier in his life, it means that he was never in a situation where he was really, truly afraid and trying to defend himself. Um, but if he passed out that time and woke up, he might not remember having done it or he might not have like seen the effects of it. I don't know, but we'll get back to that. So first we have the little bits. You know what I'm seeing? Julia, you're right. Or, Julia, nah. Jesse, Jesse, you're right. They are cutting back and forth really, really quickly between everybody. Um, so I'm just going to talk about what goes on with uh, all of them trying to take on the senator first, because it's actually really interesting. They are watching him um, give a speech at one point, and I love this. It's being he's being read by Penny, which I found really interesting that he is able to tell all of this through a, uh, like a screen. Penny is not in this man's actual presence, but he can still tune in and say, this guy really believes everything he says. Um, Senator John Gaines, I believe that everyone is born with a flame of goodness and if my light or yours go out, remember, we're not alone in this world. Which all these people are clapping and like really into what he said. And I really can't believe that this means anything. This is like so meaningless. We are not alone in this world. No, we're not. But what kind of like, I don't like it doesn't look at it. Look at the, look at the, the quote. If my flame or yours goes out, we're not alone. I mean, are you talking? Because it sounds like he's saying like hope or our lives or goodness. And it is, it's just such a meaningless speech to me, guys. I just doesn't. Um, oh, Hugabug says, uh, Penny, I think says that he went to an earlier rally and he read him then. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, he is the perfect demigod spokesman for absolute evil, is what Julia says. And I was like, that's a kind of a weird take, because he's not saying anything evil. And if he believes what he says, he's not exactly doing anything to incite hatred or harm on anybody. So she's like seeing him through the lens of who Reynard is. But that's not necessarily who this guy is at all. So she's just sort of assigning to him the same intentions as his shitty dad, which is not necessarily even there at all. But yeah, evidently, um, Penny says, dude has more magic coming off him than every magician on earth combined and knows not one thing about magic. Whoa. Than every magician on earth combined. That's a lot. That's bonkers. This guy's like the Jeff Bezos of magic. Um, also, I love the fact that Katie says how hot he is and then realizes like when she steps back that it really doesn't make any sense. But it's clearly like he has this draw, even though he's not really that hot at all. And the look that Penny gives her and everything is really just so funny. So they go to this guy's office and bust on in. It's very amusing because he's trying to like utilize the same sorts of defenses that he's used in the past. These three, by the way, don't even turn off the motherfucking security cameras when they come in, which y'all come on. How is that not one of the first things that you take care of? Are you serious right now? The only thing that I can think, because Reynard says something to Julia about the fact that she is on the security camera when the others aren't there. All I can think is that she allowed herself to be caught because she wanted this confrontation to happen because she wanted Reynard to find them. But I don't have anything to support that theory yet. It just seems like such an 
asinine, imbecilic oversight that there's no way it wasn't on purpose. I need it to be on purpose. Otherwise, I'm just angry. Um, but yeah, this dude, like when they, when they bust on in, he says, all right, whatever this is, stop. Tell me what you want. And Penny says, man, you're good. And Katie is looking at this guy and just nods like, "Mm mm-hmm. And Julia is the one person who seems totally unmoved. So she shuts the doors with magic and tells him magic is real. Penny moves using magic the way he does right next to this guy. Katie uses some battle magic to shove all of this shit off of this dude's desk there. And then Julia summons a fireball to her hand. And it's just, they're all essentially doing whatever they can immediately to get this guy to believe in magic, which can we all just talk about how much we wish every character who was accused of lying about having magical powers would just pull this kind of shit. I really do. I really do just want that to be the way it's always handled is, Hey, here's a fireball. Can we get on with our conversation, please? Um, so of course his mind leaps to that. This is some sort of weird publicity stunt that this still isn't real. This is all like weird special effects that have somehow put in place. And Julia just flat out tells him we're magicians being hunted by an evil God. And so are you. She does not tell him at this point, And so are you because you're his son. But I wish that she had just to see what his reaction is. So Julia, in her fucking infinite wisdom, this dumb bitch. So she grabs a knife and is ready to cut this man's throat because they don't need him alive. They just need his energy. And Katie is very practical and points out that there is no way for them to actually capture that energy anyway. They don't have a receptacle that they can hold it in. And that's the only thing that seems to slow Julia down. And even then she fucking pulls out this little thing and is like, oh, 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 you mean like this? To which both Penny and Katie are like, oh, my God. And they didn't realize that she completely intended to do it this way from the start and just didn't tell them because she knew that they were not going to be on board with this. And at this point, our homeboy, the senator, is like, I will not die here tonight. Get out. Get the fuck out of my office. And his eyes turn yellow and all three of them fly backward And he sort of has a little bit of a seizure, it looks like, and just collapses because he wasn't ready. And of course, Julia tries to take this as an opportunity yet again to kill him. And they have to disarm her. Julia is really getting to be a nuisance. And the thing is, I I said it last time, guys, that this isn't Julia And I just feel so bad for this character because she's constantly saddled with the task of being the one who fucks up plans every single episode. It's always Julia's fault and it sucks. Um, So they decide to abduct him, of course. And it's amazing. There's this conversation like back at the house and they have him all like tied up in the closet where fucking Todd comes by and totally notices who this guy is and knows precisely like who he is and the fact that they have him like tied up here. (sighs) He is really annoying. Fucking Todd. But yeah, they are trying to figure out what the fuck they are even going to do with him. And I gotta say, guys, I thought that they would have like more of a plan But it seems like they're just sort of of playing it by ear here, because if they hadn't intended to just kill the guy the way that they the way that Julia wants to do. It's still like Katie and Penny were the ones that said, "Okay, we're going to go like get in touch with this dude. 
They had to anticipate that this guy was not going to welcome their advances or be on their side. And they didn't have a single plan in place other than, I guess, we'll tie him up in our closet in our dorm. Guys, come on. I really just I just expected better of you. What is this? Um, but yeah, evidently not. And meanwhile, Reynard, who has figured out exactly where his son is due to this uh, this security camera thing. He finds his way to the borders of Phil of uh, Break Bill's wards, and he manages to get on into the senator's head and talk to him this way. And this is how they know that Reynard is on their trail, and he manages to eventually take down their wards with like really not that much trouble at all. Meanwhile, Quentin is in bad shape and is in the hospital wing, and it's just really not going well for him. Of course, Julia is hanging around looking very shady. Get it? <laughs> I didn't mean that, but I stand by it. So, Julia, I, I realized then, oh my God, she could fucking use this Niffin maybe. I don't know. But I was like, maybe that could work. And I was really bummed out that Quentin doesn't agree to do that, even though I 100% understand that it would not do to give the psychopath Julia what she wants if it were just about her. But it's not just about her. Reynard is a raping, murdering psychopath and... Quentin has promised to do what he can to help her. And he kind of just doesn't do what he can. He could have helped. Alice the Niffin wants him to do it as well. And he 100% just doesn't. Oh, Huggabug says Reynard doesn't take down the wards. It's a magic brownout. Oh, I didn't put that together at all. Shit. I miss that. Sorry, guys. Um, but anyway, so I just really I, I don't like the fact that like he was given a chance to sort of like redeem the fact that he didn't prioritize Julia's crisis last season enough and he doesn't redeem it he just continues holding on to alice even though he could rid the world of this thing and it's just as dangerous as the beast at least and now it not only gets to run off but it's got its fucking son too which feels like bad news um i don't know what he can do with his child now in his custody but I've got to imagine it's not great. So it just, yeah, that really bummed me out that Quentin isn't like, and again, I understand Julia can't just get what she wants by like fucking completely throwing Quentin to the wolves, which is she's 100% willing to sacrifice Quentin, a thousand percent willing to sacrifice Quentin. She does not care about him. So in that, aspect i get that we just can't have her get her way also quinton has to be in a position of strength and have his agency to say goodbye to alice the way that he needs to this can't be something that's forced upon him right so in that respect as well this can't really work out and still be meaningful to everybody. However, sometimes things aren't meaningful. Sometimes you just get put in a shitty position and have to do what you have to do. And that's fine. And frankly, Julia has been put in such a shit position so many times that I'm not going to be mad if they don't give Quentin the chance to say goodbye and come to terms with the loss of Alice. Let him struggle. Let him like, you know, let him have his agency taken away for once instead of it always being Julia. But no, they don't do that. So 
fucking Reynard winds up scooping his son up and disappearing with him. And Julia just yells, damn it. Meanwhile, Katie looks at her in absolute horror as she sees what it is that Julia has turned into. And Julia winds up waking up in a little sort of cell uh, and is asking Katie, what the fuck? Why am I back in here? Katie says it's called the clean room. No magic. Did you put it? And there, here comes this great moment, guys. I must say, I really liked her acting right here. Julia has this thing that she's doing. This actress is playing her character now who has no real soul and ability to like empathize with human beings. She is playing her as amused and interested in an abstract sort of way most of the time she doesn't she never gets really invested because to be invested in things you have to have empathy the only time that she really truly cares is when it's something that she wants so there's always a sort of bemused quality to the way that she's watching things unfold before her and in this scene, she does that, but then she, there's a rage right immediately after. So she does this sort of like, did you put a sleeping spell on me? Open this door! And it's like this immediate, it, it was very startling. Like, Julia, we know that she is dangerous, but we have not seen her, like, angry the way that we did that second. And it was a little scary because that sort of rage is like a tantrum. There's something childish about it. And yeah, I just found it very startling. Katie is unmoved and she says, I've been trying to understand you, but that's what I thought. What I've really been doing is making excuses for you. And I can't do that anymore. You threw Quentin and we're willing to sacrifice him. You were feeding him to Reynard. And Julia tries to say like, yeah, but he's fine, isn't he? And Katie's like, that was a complete accident. He, um, like the fact that he wound up being okay was a fractional percent of the, uh, of the outcomes. Like, he could have wound up maimed or killed or whatever. And you know that that was much more likely. And Julia says, well, he could have survived easily by doing what I wanted, basically. To which Katie's like, yeah, by doing what you wanted. And that's really all you see anymore. You don't feel anything. Not like a human does. It's not your fault. But, you know, we can't have you out here amongst people fucking shit up so until then until we fi figure something out we're keeping you in here and i again love the look on julia's face as she says katie before katie closes the door because it's a real look of like i'm keeping a smile on my face but i will eat your heart in front of you in a second if i get the chance and I think that is like a really nice moment because it reminds Katie that like Julia hasn't been teaming up with you since getting her shade removed because she still sees you as her friend. She, you've just been the one person who was willing to work with her and look past her crazy shit and you were very convenient to her, but you don't actually mean anything to her. Not really. Um, so, yeah, that's some shit. And I really, really hope there's a way to get her shade back. I mean, you know, we saw What's-His-Face take it from her and then put it back. And I don't know if that's still possible, if it's out here walking around somewhere. I don't know. But it would be nice. So let's go back to what's going on with Elliot. There is a pair of spells that are meant to help with uh, learning how to do 
sword fighting, but they are really, really difficult spells. And he isn't going to be able to master them in the time because he's supposed to like fight later that day. And he isn't like he could even get maybe a few moves out of it, even if he learned it only partially. But that only would work if the if the magic didn't go into a brownout again while he was fighting. So they're pretty much screwed. And at this point, Fen comes in and she tells him that she has this sword that her family made meant for a king and that there was a spell written for a king. And it's emphasized that her family understood that the royals probably were not going to apply themselves too much. So it's a very quick spell. My grandpa was the royal family's favorite swordsmith. And uh, they were too preoccupied with matters of state for busy work. With this spell and this blade, you will be a master swordsman. And... It's really frustrating, guys, because she has just saved Elliot's ass, but it does not feel as if he really believes that he can trust her still, even with everything. I mean, this is pretty much exactly what he needed, precisely the thing to save his life. And... It just, he doesn't, he doesn't connect with her at all throughout this, this episode. And it's so hard to watch. She's like trying so hard. And she says something about how I put my family first and that's you and our baby now. And she has tears in her eyes. Like she's really genuinely worried about him and cares about him. And it's so hard to watch as Elliot constantly like sidelines her. Um, so it turns out, meanwhile, that there are some fairies <laughs> that our queen could make a deal with. Margot is not interested in hearing about how duplicitous they are all she wants to know is whether or not they can fix the wellspring and the thing is that they can and i'm not entirely sure that this is going to turn out to be the worst possible decision because i don't know what else could have restored the wellspring i don't know what other options they even had at this point. So sometimes you just have to make the worst possible decision. It's just a fact of life. However, I also wish that Margot knew about the fairies because she's supposedly like a huge into the fillery books. And one would think she knew about the fairies. One would expect that was mentioned. And it's bizarre to me that this comes to her as news. Like there are certain things that maybe we don't know, but like the existence of an entire race of very powerful magical beings, I would really have expected to be included in the books. And this is a weird thing to me. Um, But regardless, she winds up fucking making a deal with them to give them Fen's child. And she never even tells Fen that this is what the deal is. She just tricks Fen into agreeing to do whatever it is that Margot asks her to do no matter what. If it means keeping Elliot alive, keeping us from going to war and fixing the wellspring. And of course, because Fen is a good hearted kind, generous soul, she agrees because it never even enters her mind that Margot could be making this bad a deal. And 
there was a moment where Margot might have been able to negotiate and change what the deal was. But when the ambassador to the fairies comes and speaks to her and tells her that he wants Fen's child, she just blurts out, are you fucking kidding me? And he blanches and walks away and clearly is offended, which means that she has lost all of her bargaining power and they will abide by the terms they have offered initially or none at all. <sighs> so, yeah, really what it comes down to is that Fen's child is probably being given up because of Margot's error. She might have been able to negotiate some other agreement. But I don't know. Maybe she couldn't. Maybe the fairies were absolutely fixated on this and this alone as a deal. And there was nothing else she could have offered them that they would have been interested in. I don't know. Um, so here comes a scene that I don't know how to feel about. Which is... All of our characters getting psyched up and singing a uh, Les Mis number as they head out into the field for Elliot to go sword fighting against another king. Part of me found this fun and part of me was struck by the fact that a lot of these folks can't really sing that well. And this was a weird thing to do. It's clear, like at the very least I appreciated. It does not seem to me like they got, you know, that like they dubbed other voices over them. These are their own voices, but yeah, some of them just really should not be singing. It's not great. Margot especially. I was startled, but her voice is no good. Um, I don't know if it's just like the doing the like low alto is a little bit too much for her. Or if it is just because it seemed like she was barely on tune. It was rough. But y'all know I'm not a huge fan of musicals. A lot of Les Mis is some of the few songs that I actually do like in mu in like classics. Um, there is plenty of it that I'm not a huge fan of, but at least it's not like the fucking, uh, what is the dude who's hiding in a theater? Phantom of the Opera. Oh God, there goes a bad score. Um, so yeah. She enchants all of the other people in the castle to sing along with him and support him in this like, and it's awful because poor Fen is singing about how he like doesn't even notice him or, or he doesn't even notice her. Um, let's see. And yet with you, my world has started, he says to Margot. And like leads her away. And Fen says, one more day all on my own. One more day with him not caring. And, oh, Fen, I'm sorry. I love her. She's so good. And she deserves better. And it's not like I don't love Margot. And it's not like her friendship with Elliot isn't like totally legit and above board. It's not like he's cheating on her. But he is completely emotionally reliant on another also very beautiful woman. And there is no way to not feel very, very threatened by that, especially considering she has recently gone through this like blip with him where he does not trust her. So, yeah, I just I really feel for Fen in this scene and it is so, so sad. Um, she's trying so hard. She really is being as good as she can be. And it's not about her anymore. Also, I want to mention again, and I know I do this all the time, but guys, whoever does the costumes for this show is so good. The outfit that, that Margot is wearing when she's first talking to Elliot, when he's practicing, is gorgeous. It's this like gold and black ensemble. But when it's time to like go out into the field, she's wearing this like 
blue silk one shoulder gown with like a uh, huge billowing coat over it and thigh high blue suede boots. It looks amazing. Elliot has this like asymmetrical green quilted jacket that looks awesome. Like everybody's just, they just look flawless. They just look so good. And I love when they come out onto the field and they're facing off against Loria and the king turns and looks at the prince like, dude, what the fuck? After they all finish their number and he says, I'm confused. And the prince says, I love that show. I uh, I was went to a boarding school on Earth. I played Javert. Yeah, I bet you did. So here begins the sword fight. Now, I will never say that Elliot is not an attractive guy. Of course, he's attractive. He's just got a very symmetrical, lovely face. He is tall and lean and shapely. But he has never been somebody who I've particularly been like, well, damn, until this scene. Elliot is like hot as balls in this scene. What is that about? Is that a me thing? Is it just because I love seeing men fight? Is that what it is? Because I really love seeing men fight, like when it's a genuine fight, not when it's a bullying thing, obviously. But there is something about him here. And he is just so serious, I think, is part of it as well. He's always kind of morose and has a, a really melancholy undercurrent, even when he's being funny. But this is a seriousness with a focus rather than nihilism. And it looks good on him. And yeah, he's coming at this king. And this fucking king has this amazing like skin and fur jacket thing on that looks dope as fuck. And immediately Elliot gets injured and he starts to really go for this king hard. And the king just breaks and runs away. So they figure that this is over. He, he punked out. He's running. That's it's done. Nope. Nope. Elliot just has to follow him into the woods. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I 1000% thought that this was going to be an ambush. Like a trillion billion thought for sure that this was a setup and that some more of the angry trees were going to be in the forest and that they were luring Elliot in there to either kill him or take him prisoner and use him as a hostage. It didn't even occur to me that we were just going to be continuing with a fair fight in the woods. Why would we? It doesn't make any sense. Let's be honest here, guys. This king deciding to go into the woods to continue the fight there doesn't make any goddamn sense. I don't know why he did this. It's not like it looked good for him to just sprint away. It's not like the trees were very helpful in the, their fight. I don't know if he was just trying to like play for time because he knew that another brownout was inevitable and that Elliot would have to have relied on magic in order to be this good at fighting. But I just don't buy it except for that the show wants them to be alone together for a while in order to have like a regular conversation. Um, so that's all that's pretty much it. And they wind up inevitably running up against a wall where Elliot has run out of his magic. And he sort of like hides up in a, like a tree. It's like a busted tree. It's like a tree stump. Now, Elliot, for his part, has a moment where he could absolutely have killed this king. And he doesn't do it. I mean, guys, I don't want this king to die. And I don't want Elliot to be somebody who just kills a guy. I really don't. But like, 
That's the point of this. And if you weren't prepared to strike when you had the opportunity, even with everything that's at stake, dude, what are you doing here? Really? I mean, the king is unarmed. Elliot even notices him checking it out to like grab his sword after the magic goes away. He has him completely at his mercy and he can't do it. And it's so frustrating. If he had killed him, all of this would have been over. But it, and and Margot would not have made the deal with the fairies. She wouldn't have had to. It would have been done before she got a chance to do that. But no, instead, it turns into this long drawn out thing. And it's a weird moment where Elliot keeps like behaving as if he can't do this because the magic is gone. But again, he has this guy cornered with no weapon. The magic isn't a factor. It doesn't make a lot of sense. So I guess I'm just supposed to think Elliot couldn't bear to kill him. And it's just really hard for me to like have sympathy for him in this moment when this is 100% what he signed up for. And like, everybody is depending on him. It's really, really hard. I just, I want to be like, Oh, I get it. You're not a killer. But like, then don't fucking sign up for this, dude. What are you doing? You should have known. Um, so yeah, it's just like, uh, it's frustrating. And Margot, for her sake, is over here convinced that like the only issue here is that the wellspring has browned out. And that means that he can't win because he doesn't have the magic to do it. She watched this moment. And I guess is unwilling to believe that Elliot had the chance and didn't take it. And is choosing to see this break as, oh, he broke and run because of the Brana and he panicked. I mean, she should be able to see that that's not what happened, but she gets fixated on bringing the wellspring back as the solution and getting Elliot to be able to carry through on this whole plan. Well, as it turns out, Elliot and this other dude have some real chemistry. And he says something about how this fucks both Fillory and Loria. If like, if this is a legit blackout and don't you realize that like both of us are going to be totally screwed. And the King says, honestly, they're so used to hardship. I don't even think it'll register. Sometimes I think they like being dissatisfied. And Elliot says, Oh, preach. If you do kill me, I guess it'll spare me decades of trying to fix a kingdom hell bent on staying broken and doomed to sexual frustration. And he says, but you have a wife. And he says, exactly. <laughs> um, so he says, one of us has to die and I'm not the one up a tree. But then says, at least you don't have to worry about getting old. And I forgot about that aspect of it, that that's not something that uh, that he would probably enjoy looking at is his own face beginning to age. Elliot would probably have a hard time with that. But he says that he would age like a fine one, which I have no doubt is true. But I also have no doubt he would have a very difficult time with it. And he says, and you are a total dilf. Um, let's just say it's too bad I have a wife. And this dude says, I get it. My love for my late wife kept me from selecting a husband too. Which immediately Elliot stops and is like, excuse me? And he says... It's a shame I have to kill you because I actually find you very attractive. And Elliot is like, fuck. And we find out that when he says my love for my late wife kept me from selecting a husband too, 
what he meant was, because I thought what he meant was, I would have taken a husband, but I am still recovering from grieving for my wife who died. And so I am not interested in a husband. And then I realized like, wait, no, he meant in the past, he did not take a husband because he loved his wife. So it turns out Elliot can have both, but nobody ever told him that. So it turns out that he can marry this dude and have this alliance with Loria and he doesn't have to kill him. And the only thing he has to do is split the wellspring, which is low key also a terrible deal. Like Elliot's trying to act like he's so smart. He's still going to do like espionage and whatnot by being married to this guy. Like that dude isn't also going to be doing the exact same thing to Elliot. But yeah, he says we're getting married. And apparently this is an old enough tradition that even Fen didn't know or else maybe she she knew and just never expected him to find out or maybe it's such an antiquated tradition that nobody has invoked it in so long that we all just kind of pretend that it never existed um but yeah before i flay whomever neglected to inform me sooner apparently all monarchs on this glorious magical planet get to have one of each a wife and a husband so now we are one big royal polyamorous family. Isn't it great? Nobody has to die. Everyone gets what they want. And Marco says, Elle, can we take a second? But she doesn't actually explain to him the fucking deal she made. I, all I can imagine is that Margot is planning to do a changeling thing and change out either trick the fairies and give them a baby that is not of royal blood, which they would immediately sense, right? Because apparently you can sense royal blood. Um, or she is going to get a non-royal baby and try and stick it in the place of Fen's baby and hope that Fen does not recognize that this is a totally different child. That's all I can think as to why she hasn't told either of them the truth yet. Because this is going to come out. What are you thinking? Lady, come on. But Fen is not that far along. So we have some time for this horrible tension to continue to build. And I am not excited about it. I'll just say that. Um. So, oh, and also he points out the fact that uh, Margot screwed the king's son, which I had not really like thought about in that context, but oh, brutal. So weird. Um, and yeah, he says what some would call pillow talk we call, and she says espionage. And he says diplomatic leverage. So the wellspring is finally replenishing itself. And of course, Margot gets real anxious looking as this news is shared, as she should. I just, how he is going to have to find out about the deal with the fairies. The meeting that she took wasn't exactly private, was it? Like, I just assumed that this was going to be the talk of the castle. But yeah, that was the deal. A 50-50 wellspring split. So she made this deal to sacrifice his child to the fairies. And they're not even going to get to keep the whole wellspring. Whew, that sucks. And Margot looks over at the window and you see these weird creatures sort of hovering there watching. But when you look back, they're not there. So 
I am not clear on, I, I assume that they were really there and just that only Margot can see them for some reason. Um, I don't know if they actually disappeared when she looked back or if it was just showing us the fact that nobody else could see them hovering there, but they do a pretty good job in making them look real creepy. They have this like a uh, very otherworldly, all extremely pale, glittery clothing, a sort of strange hunched way of carrying themselves and their eyes have like white eyeliner and white mascara and their eyebrows are like smoothed out so that they I think they put like a prosthetic over them so they don't have them anymore but it's real creepy Oof. um Oh, Jesse says, you can only see fairies after you've made a deal with them. Okay. Yeah, so they're just going to be hanging around. Dislike that. No thank you. So we go to Quentin. And he is in the middle of a parking lot. I don't know where this is exactly, but it's a strange spot. And... He's like sitting on like a hubcap or something. And he says, I am so sorry. I can't do this anymore. And he puts the Niffin box down and smashes it with a rock. And he says, Alice, I hope you meant it. I just hope that you go and do beautiful magic. And he says, Alice... Elliot says, come out. Or Elliot, Quentin says, go free. Look at me. I just totally fucking butchered it. Elliot says, come out. Oh, that is kind of funny, though. Elliot would say that, wouldn't he? Um, but yeah, he says, Quentin says, go free. And she's behind him and just sort of looks at him. And she doesn't say thank you. She doesn't do anything. She just sort of smiles. But then the smile immediately goes away and she looks kind of like, welp. And there's like a flash of anxiety there for me of, is she going to just do some fucked up shit? And she shoots straight up into the air and disappears. I don't figure this is the last time we're seeing Alice at all. But I hope that we're given some time without her before she turns back up again, because I really want her to go on some adventures or to do some shit and get to come back and like, tell us about it, you know, or yeah, like, I don't know. I honestly, it would be kind of dope if she just like decided to go up against fucking Reynard for the sake of it. But I don't know, like, would she go after that fucking priest who refused to help her, that monk? Um, because she's just free now. So he, they, the two of them are like on the same plane, but he's probably just so much more powerful. Even if she's out, it's not like she broke free herself. She just, unless she managed to like hurt Quentin on purpose to get him to free her. Did she convince him that he was going to die when that wasn't really what was happening? I don't know. I I sort of skipped over it because in the end it didn't really matter. But I did like her, like when Quentin is acting as Alice and speaking to Julia and they make their little deals with one another. Um, and she tells Julia, like, you see the world like you're supposed to see it. And the two of them are just, you know, both terrible psychopaths. So, of course, they would think that. Um, but yeah, so this episode just like bummed me out and, uh, made me sad and anxious and I'm really worried about the next one. I have no idea what's coming. So, um, so yeah, anyway, thank you very much to Ashley for commissioning this episode. I hope that you guys had fun and that you've been enjoying the coverage and I will see you soon with a new episode until then toodaloo motherfuckers.
was an unspoiled network podcast.